Euphoria season two just ended, so we're gonna talk about it. And if you've already seen my videos before, you know that I probably have already watched the show about 50 times and I'm about to deliver some stupid good insight. So buckle up and spoilers. The first season of Euphoria had an estimated budget of over $100 million, and even though I can't figure out how much season 2 costs to make, I'm assuming that they got their budget back and then some. In fact, the production got Kodak to remake the discontinued Ektachrome Super 35mm film stock just for Euphoria. So when you see that gorgeous, gorgeous film grain. You know that it's real, and you know that they went above and beyond to achieve that aesthetic. And the blooming and the colors, oh my gosh, I freaking love Ektachrome. Anyway, on with the analysis. In season one, Fez told Nate to leave Ruin Jewels alone. So Nate, being the wonderful human being he is, decides to call the police and tell them that Fez is a drug dealer and is running a whole operation. Subsequently, Fez and his brother get raided and have to flush all of their product down the toilet. But their biggest issue is that they received that product from this guy, a scary drug dealer named Mouse. And before the Great Flush, Mouse forced a lot of his product onto Fez. So after Fez discarded of the product, he had to come up with the money somehow. Fez is left with no other choice but to rob Mouse's supplier, aka like an actual doctor. At the beginning of Season 2, Custer quickly mentions that he was trying to get a hold of the doctor Fez robbed at the end of Season 1. Now, I don't know exactly how much time elapsed between Fez being the life out of this doctor and Custer saying this, but it looks like it was enough time to get Custer proper bandages, and enough time for him to heal a little bit from his injuries. Plus, we end Season 1 with the Winter Formal at the end of the semester, and start Season 2 on New Year's. So at least a couple of weeks have passed since Fez robbed Mouse's supplier. Meaning, Custer still hasn't heard from the doctor after a few weeks. This means either two things happened. Fez ended up killing the doctor from the beatdown he gave him, or the doctor's son called the paramedics and the prescription drugs uh, that the doctor had at his house were discovered, sending the doctor to prison and causing him to lose his medical license. And just because Fez is our champion, I'm going to assume that the second thing happened and not that he killed the guy. Regardless, Mouse and the doctor were out of the picture, so the duo, Fez and Ash, needed a new supplier. So, Custer introduces them to Lori. Lori used to be a school teacher, but found no money in it, so she became a drug dealer. And that's the only backstory you're getting. But if that backstory isn't some good social commentary about the current state of our education system, then I don't know what is. But to be fair, after watching Lexi's play, their school must be pretty well funded. Meanwhile, Rue is itching to get drugs. So she came up with a plan that consisted of her obtaining drugs by becoming a drug dealer, which always goes well. Relationships aside, Fez immediately turned down her proposal because she's a drug addict to asking for $5,000 worth of drugs. Elliot said Rue's plan was a good idea idea, but he's a high schooler, so he's not really in a position to give his opinion on drug deal operations. But either way, Lori accepts Rue's whacked out proposal, and Rue is given one month to sell an entire suitcase worth of drugs. Lori knew that Rue was gonna fail. I mean, look at Rue's eyes when she was practicing her pitch in the mirror. Rue's plan consisted of recruiting three other girls from her high school with 3.7 GPAs to sell drugs. These girls don't exist, obviously. Then as collateral, each of their phones would be uploaded to a cloud that Rue owned. That way, if any of them snitched, it would jeopardize their entire future of them getting into their dream schools, which they aren't applying to because they don't exist. This is a horrible plan. The point is, Lori said it was amazing, which it wasn't, and was banking on Rue failing. By the way, Elliot really dropped the ball on this one, because because Elliot was the one person we see Rue reveal her plan to, meaning Elliot knew where the drugs in the suitcase came from. So I don't know why he didn't try to stop Jules or Rue's mom from flushing the drugs down the toilet, because he must have had some idea of how screwed Rue would be if they literally destroyed the product. But anyway, I digest, because as is expected, Rue didn't sell any of the drugs. So at this point, she doesn't even have any money to go out and buy some. After Rue goes to Fez's place to find something to help with her withdrawal, Fez reveals that he hasn't kept any drugs in the house ever since he got raided. So we can all thank Nate Jacobs for that one. Rue, in her hour of desperation, heads to the one person who she knows has drugs, Massage Chair Woman, also commonly referred to as Lori. Before this encounter between Lori and Rue in the episode Stand Still Like the Hummingbird, it's important to note that Rue had one month to come up with the money that she owed Lori. In the episode before the one where Rue acquires the suitcase, she spots Cassie and Nate together. Then 
fast forward to stand still like the hummingbird. Specifically that one moment where she reveals Cassie's secret. And Maddie asks, What are you talking about? To which Rue responds, I saw her get in his truck and then kiss him and drive off. That was like, what, like a... Meaning a little over a month has passed since Rue got the drugs from Lori, telling us that Rue was clearly never going to sell the drugs, because she didn't, and that she is currently late on her payment to Lori. After first accepting the deal, Lori tells Rue, If you screw me, I'll have you kidnapped and sold to some real sick people. And that she always finds a way to make her money back. I love how Lori tells Rue this after she already accepts the deal, just further reinforcing my point that Lori definitely planned this from the beginning. That, and the fact that Lori goes on to say, When I first saw you, I thought, this girl is going to be in my life for a long time. During Rue and Lori's conversation, Lori explains that she herself went through withdrawal. In fact, she even did her own research on opiates, as she explains that over time, all the chemicals that make you feel good start to decrease because you're getting it artificially, telling us that Lori fully understands how desperate and helpless Rue is in her current state. But as Lori is explaining Rue's future of destroying her brain with drugs, the camera goes down the hall and stops at this door with a lock on it. And if you listen closely, you can hear scratching on the other side side of the door. There's definitely been moments in the show where like the pill bottles talk to Rue, and at first I thought this was the closet that Lori kept the drugs in, and then like the clawing would be like, you know, Rue's need to like claw into the door and then get the drugs, but it was a completely different door, implying that there's someone behind that door, someone who's clearly been drugged up and is currently living Lori's threat. During their conversation, Lori claims that the good part about being a woman is that if you don't have money, you've still got something people want. So Lori had every intention of making what's going on behind this door Rue's future. And I think the thing to solidify all of this is the fact that Rue was locked in the next morning, with her window being locked and even the front door being locked. Yeah, Rue was definitely going to be held against her will. Oh my goodness, that's so creepy. And on top of all of this. Lori claims that earlier in the week, she had an entire assortment of drugs that could take the pain away. However, she now apparently only has morphine, and only the intravenous. But then, Lori pulls out her luggage case to get the morphine, and then we see every single drug known to mankind in there. But Lori specifically picked intravenous, and made Rue believe that she was not holding her arm steady, which Rue definitely was, so that Lori could then make a whole bunch of injection marks on her, so that Rue would appear like a heavy user, and would lose any credibility if she tries going to the police about Lori. Just another haunting detail about this scene where Rue's trying to escape, is that when she drops the keys, all the birds start making noise. At first I was like, okay, well this is just like the editor trying to raise suspense. But then on like the second viewing, it's almost like they're trying to tell us that the birds are a way of covering up any noise that's coming from that room with the person locked in it. Using the birds the same way Brucey uses music when he's forcing everyone to strip so we could see if they're wearing a wire. The birds in Lori's apartment, and the title of the episode, Stand Still Like the Hummingbird, are no coincidence. It's clearly symbolic of how Rue, being the hummingbird, was going to be put in a cage, like the actual birds in literal cages. The shot composition right here even makes this wooden divider look like prison bars or a cage. So it's fitting that this shot of Lori preparing the morphine is followed by this shot of the caged bird. Also, I very much appreciate how they filmed this final shot of Rue leaving Lori's apartment. At first, when I saw the car come by, I just thought, oh, it's just to induce more anxiety. But it actually does more than that. The production of Euphoria must have been patting themselves on the back when they realized that the car could actually serve two purposes. The first one being opening the gate so that Rue can escape. And the second purpose was covering up Zendaya, replacing her stunt double. As the car moves in front of the stunt double right here, so they can pull a switcheroo. Oh god, I did not mean to make a pun. Okay, puns aside, this car allows them to make it seem like Zendaya jumped out of the window and then just continued on running towards the gate. One could even say they were killing two birds with one stone. <laughs> what is wrong with me? But I guess Lori isn't someone Rue has to be worried about anymore, because Faye kept saying that it was Lori who killed Mouse. Custer's dead, so he can't really dispute that fact. And with the police listening in on Custer's phone when Faye was saying this, the cops may be going after Lori, and they'll eventually uncover her entire operation. Which brings us to, oh boy, here it is. 
this, is Fezco safe? I don't think Fez is going to prison. And if he does, it won't be for that long. As I mentioned earlier, Fez didn't have any drugs in the house because of Nate. So the cops can't charge him with that. The murder of Custer is going to be pinned on Ash because Ash did it. And Faye is a witness to back it up. Ash's shootout with the police further legitimizes the story that Ash was acting alone. As the entire time, Fez was trying to talk him down. Plus, the last words the cops hear on Custer's phone is Ash, no. But Fez may be charged with trying to cover up the murder, but we'll see. The three things that could screw Fez over is that he wiped off Ash's fingerprints from the murder weapon, and he was also holding said murder weapon when the cops came in, so yeah, that may be an issue. Also, the guns. Uh, yeah, the guns. All I know is that there is still that small possibility of Lexi and Fez getting their little house on the prairie, or him and Cal sharing a prison cell. Oh, also, did anyone catch that one detail during Fez and Lexi's conversation at the beginning of the finale, when Fez claims, Nobody's ever got shot at and thought to themselves, Oh, thank goodness we didn't have a gun to shoot back, you know? Which is exactly what ends up happening to him, where he gets shot and just wants his brother to give up the guns. In this soon-to-be Emmy Award-winning episode, where it's revealed that Elliot and Jules were listening to the very private encounter between Rue and her family, Leslie says to Rue, You look embarrassed, Rue. You embarrassed because Jules just heard everything you said? Own that shit. Own what you just said. Knowing that other people in the world have now laid witness to the hell Rue puts her family through, Lexi was nervous about how Cassie would react to her play, but didn't realize how it would affect everyone else. Lexi, being a quiet observer, reveals the intimate and private aspects of the lives around her. The only people who seem to be okay with how they're portrayed is Rue and Suze. Because Suze may be an alcoholic, and dealing with her own form of addiction, which is why she's more sympathetic towards someone like Rue. As Suze actually understands the powerlessness Rue is experiencing. But Suze still manages to be present for her kids, and appears to be trying her best at being a parent. So she doesn't feel there is too much to be ashamed of. And Rue already had the worst side of herself revealed to the world, so she ends up looking at the play as something more heartwarming and illuminating. But no one else really takes Lexi's play well, Nate. Oh, Nate. I gotta say, Nate is perhaps one of the most irredeemable characters in any of the over-the-top teen dramas that I've watched in the past eight weeks. Around the age of eight, when, to quote his mother, the darkness took over Nate, it was around the same time he discovered a bunch of CDs in his father's desk. CDs that contained videos of his father having sex with various people who are not his mother, both men and women. These recordings shaped Nate's understanding of sex as he repeatedly watched them while listening to the words his father said in them. Them. And Cassie was also messed up by her father. At the age of something, Cassie's dad left her and her family. Her father became addicted to drugs in the hospital, and is later seen with injection marks on the left side of his arm when stealing valuable dining ware from Cassie's house. Cassie is still suffering from the trauma of her father leaving and is having a really hard time dealing with these abandonment issues, leading Cassie to wrongfully seek external validation, and will do anything for other men in her life to love her, care about her, etc., leading to toxic people like Nate Jacobs, taking advantage of that. When we see the flashback of Lexi and Cassie getting into the car with her father, who is clearly in no position to drive, Cassie's main concern wasn't her safety, or even her sister's safety, but how she made her dad feel, which tells you everything about Cassie's current state. She's willing to compromise her own safety and the safety of others to keep the affection of someone like her dad or a boyfriend. This scene with her dad reminded me of how she put herself in danger at the beginning of the season by getting in Nate's car while he was intoxicated and speeding, the night that formed the most toxic relationship of the year, as they are both suffering severely from their own daddy issues. You know what? It's important to note that Cassie was willing to follow Nate out of the auditorium when he stormed off, but Nate wasn't willing to do the same for her. Cassie says that Nate can control every aspect of her life, saying this because she just wants to dedicate her life to being loved. So Nate ends up dressing her up in whatever he wants, deciding to make Cassie a mix of Maddie and Jules. Nate and his dad share a whole bunch of parallels, starting with how they're both bisexuals, and have been keeping themselves back from exploring a life that they want to live. The main reason being the influence of their fathers. Cal's father pushed him to live a certain lifestyle, and Cal would later force the same ideals onto Nate. So it's almost wrong for Cal to be so defensive about Nate being one of the people in his life responsible for his unhappiness, when he suppressed his own son the same way that his father kept him from exploring his sexuality. But I also think that that's why they hate each other so 
much. They're essentially the same person. But season two changes a lot of things. We start the season with Nate receiving a beatdown from Fez and Cal receiving a beatdown from Ash. So Cal and Nate both rock the headcast this season, which as we all know, is completely intentional. When wearing his headcast, Cal comes to a revelation that he's lonely and chose to live a life that he never wanted to live. While Nate, on the other hand, has a similar revelation, but the inverse, where he sets out to take over the family business, marry Cass, and follow in his father's footsteps, living a supposedly ideal life that he will eventually be dissatisfied with. In special episode part two, Jules was entertaining the idea of going off her hormones, a huge contrast from the conversation she had with Anna in season one, episode seven, when Jules claims that she wants to conquer her femininity. But during her therapy session in special episode, she claims that it felt as if her femininity conquered her. Jules also expresses that she framed her entire womanhood around men, and came to the realization that she's no longer interested in what men want, and has this frustration knowing that she spent her entire life building her body, personality, and soul around what she thinks men desire. Which would explain why in season 1, Jules has this sort of hyper-feminine look, but after her revelation, she changes her style to something more androgynous. When discussing where Jules is at with her sexuality and gender, Hunter Schaefer, who plays Jules, claimed, If I have learned anything from being trans for my whole life, it's that, you know, that spiral kind of never stops. I think I was at around her age when I started to understand that transitioning wasn't this point A to point B sequence. And when hearing about her mother's progress with being clean for nine months, Jules is still skeptical and assumes her mother will relapse, as her mother has repeatedly given up her hopes in the past. So when Jules tells Leslie about Rue being back on drugs, it really goes to show how much Jules cares about her. Jules has already been through hell dealing with a loved one who is struggling to get clean, and Jules is willing to go through this exhausting and traumatizing process again for Rue. Jules never brought up her mother around Rue, because she didn't want Rue to think that she has resentment towards her the same way that she resents her own mother. But still, subconsciously, Jules is angry at Rue for creating that imbalance in their relationship. However, the driving force that made Jules leave at the end of Season 1 is that she didn't want to feel responsible for Rue. Rue depended on Jules to stay clean, and that was way too much pressure for Jules. So when Rue tells Jules that she relapsed right after she left, Jules did not take that lightly. In special episode, Jules claims that she's still in love with Nate, and doesn't know if that's going to change. In fact, at one point, she even says that the sexting between them was the best sex she ever had. And when Nate dropped off the disc, they both admitted that they met every word when they were texting. And because of this, I have a feeling that Nate and Jules still have this possibility of getting together at some point in the future. But it's clearly not gonna last. Since the beginning of the series, Tyler, I mean Nate, has been coming to terms with his sexuality. And I feel like him finally getting together with Jules would be the most freeing thing for him. By the way, Nate threatens Maddie with shooting himself if she doesn't reveal where the disc is. Nate gets the disc and then turns to Maddie and delivers a, it's just a prank bro. Even though that was ridiculous, he was at least truthful about it. Because I have no life, so I slowed down the footage, paused it right here to where Nate is supposedly putting one bullet in the gun. Then I increase the brightness of this frame so we can better see everything. And if you look right here, there is no bullet in his hand. So he was indeed faking it, and Maddie was safe, and so was Nate. However, Nate possibly lied when he told Jules that, to the best of his knowledge, nobody made copies of the video with her and Cal. I'm assuming Nate gave the police the thumb drive containing all of Cal's encounters that he recorded, which would include the tape of Jules. Since we know this particular encounter to be the most incriminating one that Cal filmed, Cal resented Nate because Nate was protecting Cal's life, which was a life that Cal never wanted to live. So the tragic part is that when Cal escapes his family, the resentment that he has towards Nate is almost gone, because Cal is no longer being kept from the life he wants to live. But Nate is still lost, and has exhausted all of his options to understand himself and why he feels the way he does. So he turns his dad into the police so he can take over the family business and ultimately get rid of his father and pursue this ideal life. However, this will not stop Nate's unhappiness. Like Cal, Nate's blaming his internal struggles on external things. After Cal gets free from his prison-like suburban life, he starts taking responsibility and holding himself accountable. He went from this. Not my biggest regret. You are. To this. I f***ed up, Nate. I love you. 
And I should have protected you. I should have kept you safe. And I didn't. And there's nothing I regret more. But Maddie tells Cassie that it's just the beginning, implying that Cassie and Nate are going to continue this very toxic relationship. Probably a more toxic relationship than Nate and Maddie. Speaking of Maddie, Maddie babysits for this kid named Theo. His mother, Samantha, has a pretty amazing house with a really rocking closet. So every time Maddie puts Theo to bed, she heads over to that closet and dresses up in Samantha's clothing. We've seen a couple of instances where Maddie has to quickly get dressed back into her normal clothes before Samantha gets home. One time, it was such a close call that Maddie accidentally left one of the drawers open. Okay, and here's like the craziest part. In episode 6, after she gets a text from Samantha that Samantha's like 15 minutes away, we see the shot of a clock, and right next to the numbers on the clock is what appears to be a camera pointed directly at Maddie with a red light on, which as we all know is the universal symbol for recording. And another detail to help with this theme of like recording each other is later in the episode when Nate confronts Maddie, there's a smile you're on camera sign that appears throughout the scene, as Nate asks Maddie why his dad likes to record himself having sex. Then, in episode 7, Samantha gives Maddie the purple dress from the night where Maddie left the drawer open. I honestly have no idea where this story between Maddie Maddie and Samantha is headed, but I have a bad feeling about it. Anyway, the night of Halloween, Jules found out that her mother relapsed, on top of having to do something extremely unethical and illegal for Nate, explaining why she was so distant from Rue that night, as well as explaining her reckless behavior. During the Halloween party, Jules hops in the pool, and then recites Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, specifically Juliet's line from Act 2, Scene 2, saying, Although I joy in thee, I have no joy of this contract tonight. It's too rash, too unadvised advised, too sudden, too like the lightning, which doth cease to be. Ere one can say it lightens, sweet good night, this bud of love, by summer's ripening breath, may prove a beauteous flower when next we meet. Some of you may be thinking, what? Which is a completely valid thought when you're trying to interpret Shakespeare in the year 2022. Basically, with these words, Juliet is telling her love interest, Romeo, to pump the brakes a little bit. She doesn't want to rush into things, and she just needs some time, because there's a lot of things getting in their way right now. In Romeo and Juliet's case, it's their two families and their animosity towards one another. And in Jules and Rue's case, it's Rue's drug addiction and Jules having to deal with Nate. Rue looks at herself in Lexi's play the same way that we as an audience view Rue. We don't see her as someone who is irredeemable. And Rue finally sees that, and understands that there's still some hope for her. Lexi was worried about hurting Cassie, but sometimes it's necessary to give people a good look at themselves. Like how Elliot ruined his friendship with Rue, by telling Leslie that Rue was using. Because in Rue's case, Elliot ended up saving Rue from herself. Elliot confirms that he's still going to use drugs, so they're definitely going to be splitting into different paths next season. Because Rue is not going to be able to maintain being clean if she's around people like Elliot. Sam Levinson, this guy, right here, wrote, directed, produced, and created Euphoria, so he has some influence with what the show is and where it's headed. Back in the 2019 premiere of Euphoria, Levinson claimed that he spent the majority of his teenage years in and out of hospitals, rehabs, and halfway houses. He was a drug addict, and he'd take anything and everything until he couldn't hear or breathe or feel, something that's reflected in Rue's character as she uses drugs to escape her unbearable reality reality only for a brief moment. Levinson took his trauma and put it into euphoria the same way that Lexi puts her life into her play. I think Lexi's play answers the question, why does Cal record himself? Rue better understands herself from the outside looking in. She was able to work through the frustration she had with herself and was able to start a new path of change. The same thing eventually happens to Cal. Maddie, Cassie, and Nate also learned a lot about themselves by watching the story about their lives. Like Rue, Lexi lost a parent. But Lexi's way of handling it was creating something, and Rue's way of handling it was destruction. When Jules sits next to Rue after the play, and tells Rue everything that she wants to hear, Rue kisses her on the forehead, and then leaves without saying a word. In this moment, Rue is being strong enough for the both of them, because Rue realizes that she can't keep hurting the people around her, and needs to not be in a relationship, so that she doesn't have to rely on Jules, and can fix herself on her own. But during the voiceover, Rue gives that 
at the end of the episode, she said that she stayed sober till the end of the school year, implying that she will eventually relapse in season 3. So about a week and something ago, I made a poll on my channel asking the question, does Euphoria romanticize the bad stuff? Followed by the question, is Euphoria a TV show? Followed by the question, where am I? But back to the more legitimate question of does Euphoria romanticize the bad stuff? Romanticize can also substitute for glorify, and the bad stuff as in the over-sexualization, abuse, drug abuse, and all that. You can still vote by the way, just go to my community tab. At the time of recording this video, the results are 71% yes and 29% no. So it seems that a lot of people are in favor that it does romanticize such things. And at one point, one of my friends even referred to the show as godless. But what they meant by that is to them, Euphoria had no meaning. It's just pointlessly gruesome, provocative, and every other similar adjective in the book. Pure shock value and nothing more. But I'm going to go ahead and make the argument against that. Because when it comes to this poll, I would vote no. And I can't tell if it's my love for this show or my sadistic need to get myself canceled before my career even takes off. But let me explain my reasoning. Here's my case defending Euphoria. I think I like TV and movies more than I like life. So out of respect for the work of art, blockbuster, or masterpiece I'm watching, I don't judge the work of art until I see it in its entirety. Sorry, this sounds so cheesy, but I'm serious. It's a good habit. Like, I hate Archive 81. I literally couldn't make it through. I, I think I got like four episodes in. But because I haven't finished it, I feel that I don't know exactly what it was trying to say. So I don't really feel like I'm in a position to judge it. If you can't already tell where I'm going with this, I don't really judge Euphoria and the fact that it would be glorifying or romanticizing these things until I see it in its entirety. At times, Euphoria is not realistic in the slightest. The over-sexualization, over-dramatized acting, surreal vivid imagery, and quick flow editing that cuts as smooth as a hot knife slicing through a stick of room temperature butter is not meant to represent reality, but to depict what the individual experiences in their head, whether that be the bizarre fantasies we have, our inner desire for someone else, and so on. That's why we are shown inception levels of cinematography to convey the sheer bliss and euphoric experience Rue has when she's on the drugs, so those who don't experience substance abuse can better sympathize with her need to be on them. It's not meant to glorify, but to put you more in their perspective. And of course it's going to be entertaining because you f***ers want to watch it otherwise. Also hold on, I'm not done with my original point. The point is that all these surreal sequences glorifying irresponsible behavior and toxic habits are immediately followed by the realistic consequences to their actions, shown to us in a very, very grounded way. Euphoria breaks the realism, yet manages to pull you back into the believability of it all with some of the most realistic portrayals of depression and substance abuse that I've seen since like Bojack Horseman. And I think season 2, episode 5 and 6, Stand Still Like the Hummingbird and A Thousand Little Trees of Blood are prime examples of that very thing. Stand Still Like the Hummingbird may be the greatest anti-drug PSA in existence, as that was the most realistic portrayal of withdrawal I think I've ever seen in cinema. I think these episodes are indicative of where the show is headed. Levinson mistreated almost everyone in his life that he loved, so he fought to become clean and tried to become a better person. Euphoria is is like a really big come down. When discussing his approach to season 2, Levinson claimed that if season 1 was a party at 2 a.m., season 2 should feel like 5 a.m., way past the time where everyone should have gone home. Levinson has been clean for over 15 years now, ending his drug use relatively around the same age as Rue. So if Levinson is basing Rue's character off of his own experience with drug use, it's most likely that the show is going to focus on her road to recovery and end with her finally being off drugs for good. Good. So apparently, out of all the people that watch my videos, only 2.2% .2 of you are subscribed to me. And it's like, bruh, subscribe. Those were all my thoughts on Euphoria today. Thanks for watching.